Religion and theology have become a nearly universal trait throughout world cultures, and a tenet is that religion and theology are usually based on the influence of previous cultures or beliefs. Many of the basic principles of Christianity, and most especially the monastic society, can be paralleled to Buddhist principles established long before Christianity was conceived. This will focus on the comparisons of monastic life in the roles of Christian and Buddhist monks, and the influences of Buddhist philosophy on Christian beginnings in the Middle East from Emperor Asoka and others that may have led to the current monastic lifestyle through the Hellenistic cults. When comparing Buddhist and Christian monastic lifestyle, a number of similar attributes are apparent in daily life and practice. Buddha's aims in creating the Sangha are causation of many of the similarities between the Buddhist and Christian monastic societies. The singular drive to attain nirvana for the Buddhists and union with God for Christians can lead to strong measures to separate the devoted from desires or distractions from the path. The Christian term for a single-minded drive that focuses on the attainment of communion is monotropos, having a single aim, or in other words, a single desire for the total commitment of self to God or any other spiritual aim. What the Christians call monotropos, the Buddhists call chitaikogruta in Sanskrit, meaning one-pointedness of mind. Both Christian and Buddhist monks have at times separated themselves from the surrounding population, often diving into seclusion in order to practice their beliefs. In many Christian traditions, the use of isolation and solitude is a direct result of the singular drive they have to establish communion with God. The daily distractions of the world and the potential problems of followers or devotees could draw a monk out of their intended or proper path. A Buddhist monk may also choose isolation from the surrounding world to strengthen him or herself on the path to enlightenment. The Sangha was used as a communal reinforcement for removing desires and distractions. According to Barnes, it became customary for itinerant or hermit monks to meet for periodic retreats at monasteries, often for two or three months during the rainy season, to confirm the teachings of the community. Later, settled monasteries were established and maintained through donations by laypersons. Common traits to both philosophies involve the use of celibacy in the path to enlightenment. To a Christian monk, celibacy is claimed to be essential for those wishing to realize the monastic goal, since without it, the practitioner will be forced to divide his or her attention and energy between the desire to please the spouse and the desire to fulfill the monastic objective. In essence, without removing temptation, the distractions will be too great to achieve union with God. The Buddha himself also considered the objective of celibacy to be a worthy goal in the path to enlightenment. The Buddha referred to our human body as a nine-holed, ever-leaking wound, and we are given to visualize someone we find attractive as a decaying corpse. Buddhists still considered married men as candidates to enter the community, as long as they were willing to leave their marriage. Celibacy is fourth on the Noble Eightfold Path, stating that a follower must maintain proper action. There are still many critics of celibacy in both the Christian and the Buddhist tradition, stating that it is impractical or immoral to not have children. The reaction of these communities is that not everyone in a society must practice celibacy. Only those on the path to enlightenment whom wish to maintain morality must practice it. The idea of being a missionary, or one that travels spreading the word, can be traced back to the Sangha in the time of the Buddha. By the command of the Buddha, Wandering monks would convene together during the rainy season, but other than at those times, Buddhist monks roamed the land spreading the word of the Buddha. These missionaries were highly successful in spreading the word of the Buddha, and that many people traveled, it is said, from all over India to hear the Buddha Dharma and receive ordination. The spread of Buddhism from its origins in India to the Christian missions was helped by King Asoka of the Mauryan Empire. Asoka was, at the beginning of his term as a king, a great conqueror. In the expansion of his empire, Asoka inflicted a number of brutalities on the Kalinga, a neighboring region. It is said that after his armies had slaughtered the populace, that Asoka went out to view the aftermath and destruction. At that moment, he was supposedly filled with horror and revulsion, and summarily committed his life to the strict teachings of the Buddha. He vowed never to cause harm again, or his grief would overtake him. Asoka's transformation to Buddhism inspired him to spread the word of the Buddha far and wide and to many regions that contained the beginnings of Christianity. These missionaries, known as Duttas, 
in Sanskrit were men that carried the word of the Buddha in Ahsoka's stead. It is known that many of these missionaries made it to Rome in the centuries before Christianity. In a writing by Clement of Alexandria, he notes that philosophy of things of the highest utility flourished in antiquity among the barbarians, shedding its light over the nations. Some too of the Indians obeyed the precepts of Bauta, whom on account of his extraordinary sanctity they have raised to divine honors. During these missions, Ahsoka and his followers built large monuments depicting his revelations as part of his Dharma Mahamatra. These stupas and viharas contain what are later known as the Edicts of Ashoka, a grouping of general practices that he considered to be universally necessary. Ahsoka has only recently been credited with these structures, as he used a pseudonym as Devanampiya Piyadasi Raja, the beloved of the gods, the king Piyadasi. These stupas focused on three main precepts, the moral precepts, religious precepts, and social welfare. The moral precepts of kindness to prisoners, right behavior, and respect for animal life also appear in the Christian traditions and in their monastic lifestyle. Buddhist thought was not only spread by missionaries from Buddhist countries. Some Western empires, in their expansion efforts, brought back Buddhist thought and practices. Alexander the Great, as part of his conquering, overtook many countries in the Middle East with strong Buddhist followers. After Alexander's death, his conquering opened up a number of areas for later reclamation by the Bactrians and led to a Greco-Bactrian state. King Menander, as a follower of the Buddha, helped spread Buddhist philosophy to the West. Of all the places, it was cosmopolitan Alexandria, with its direct trading links with the west coast of India, the Indus Valley, and through that with Bactria, which could realistically pick up on information on religious developments. This opened the spread of knowledge from the Hellenistic kingdoms to the west. These Hellenistic cults and kingdoms, including the Gnostics, absorbed many of the Buddhist traditions, incorporating them into their doctrine. These cults, in turn, paved the way for the Christian movement. The Hellenistic cults overall were developed in the wake of Alexander and the collapse of his empire. They mixed Buddhist doctrine with religious ideals, creating something that was a mix between Buddhist thought and theology. The Gnostics filled a time of religious anarchy leading into the Christian era. It is noted that the Ophites adopted the myths and beliefs which had sprung out of the cults and correlated them into more or less superficial manner with speculative and Christian ideals. Valentinus converted these Ophite conceptions into something like a real theology. Valentinus went on to become a candidate for the Pope in the first century AD, losing only by a narrow margin, but continued preaching his Gnostic philosophy until his death. Valentinus, as a native of Egypt, studied in Alexandria, where he would have been exposed to Buddhist travelers. Arising from the same area, St. Anthony, generally seen as the founder of Christian monasticism, began his life in Upper Egypt to a wealthy family. At the age of 20, he renounced his possessions and began a lifetime of radical solitude and prayer. Although no direct correlation is proven between the spread of Buddhist culture and the beginnings of Christian monastic life, it is important to understand that St. Anthony and others that emulated this lifestyle would have been conveniently placed to hear the message of the Buddha and apply it to Christian teachings. When Ahsoka spread Buddhism west and Alexander the Great brought Buddhism back, the similarities between Buddhist monks and Christian monks are striking.